resumes are still necessary, but they're also only getting six to seven seconds of somebody's attention. Whether you're applying for funding or a new role, give us something worth reading. If I drop a stack of resumes, why should I pick yours up first? Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing, numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Have you ever wondered if your resume, website, or LinkedIn is accurately showcasing what you do best? It's time for a glow up. And today I have just the powerhouse guest to help us. She's a trailblazer in the world of career consulting, known for her ability to help professionals snatch a seat at the table or break it all together. Jessica Williams is the founder and CEO of JMW Career Consulting, a company that has already made a significant impact in 2023 by supporting over 15 professionals in retaining a staggering $2 million in salary increases, equity options, and work from home benefits. With her expertise and guidance, individuals have transformed their careers, shattered glass ceilings, and secured the opportunities they truly deserve. In our conversation, Jessica is sharing her wealth of knowledge on the critical elements of a resume, a LinkedIn, and a website portfolio. We're talking the do's and the don'ts. Whether you're looking for a job, showcasing your work online, or making your next hire, get ready to take notes because Jessica's strategies and advice will undoubtedly help take you to the next level. Without further ado, let's dive right in. Jessica, welcome to the Gold Digger Podcast. Pop quiz, who do you think is more popular these days, Taylor Swift or ChatGPT? Now, although our feeds are flooded with hype around the era's tour, ChatGPT is actually beating Taylor Swift in search volume, which tells us that the AI revolution is upon us. That's why HubSpot's brand new AI power tools, Content Assistant and ChatSpot are all the rage. Content Assistant helps you brainstorm, create and share content in a flash, all inside a super easy to use CRM. And ChatSpot, which runs on OpenAI's GPT powered tech, automates all the manual tasks inside of HubSpot to help you engage more customers, close more deals and scale your business faster. Both are designed to help you get more done, stand out amongst the competition, and work smarter, not harder. Find out more about how to use AI to grow your business at HubSpot.com slash artificial dash intelligence. Again, that's HubSpot.com slash artificial dash intelligence to check out these tools for yourself. This episode is sponsored by Ritual, daily essentials created by a team of scientists and nutritional experts who are dedicated to your daily health. Visit ritual.com slash gold digger to get 20% off your first month. Jessica, I am so excited to have you on the gold digger podcast. Thanks for being with me today. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Okay, Wait, so you are you. so well known for helping your clients find career success. I found this amazing article about you and I messaged my team right away and I was like, we have to get her on the show. And one thing I love about this term career success is you help people kind of define what that means for them. And so how did you find yourself in this position to be a career consultant and to help people find their own level of success? So like most people, I fell into it. There is no way I knew that you could finesse a resume to get six figures. I had no clue. I was working a nine to five that I was actually working 60 hours a week and I still couldn't pay my bills. So I was like, okay, let's figure out how we're going to do this. Yeah. Let's spin it. I've always been the woman who could find a job. My parents and my brother taught me how to do an application and a resume. And that was it. And I've been turning people's careers upside down and inside out. How did you get into it? So you did it for yourself, but what did it look like? Like, who was the first person you helped? I feel like we will never forget like our first like client or customer. Tell me that story. Okay. So realistically, I had no idea how to do a resume. Right. And I met with somebody. His name was Kyle. He put me on game. He was like, jump on LinkedIn is free. Do the 30 days trial and then see if you can find clients. 
I jumped on LinkedIn, did the pro pitch. So yeah. you go in and people are looking for resumes and all this. I did a lady's cover letter. She had me do three cover letters. I had no idea how to write a cover letter. Yeah. I said, okay, this is it. You either do it now or you, it's never going to happen. I did three cover letters for her for, I think, $75. And I was like, oh, shoot. I just made big bucks yes. at that time, right? 2018. <laughs> yeah. And she loved it. And she actually is a reoccurring client. From me not knowing what to do and now finessing everybody else's resume, people coming to find me by word of mouth. And I'm like, okay, you have to take that risk. I took a risk. Let's be very honest. I had no idea what I was doing. No idea. I just knew I've always had the word ninja ability. Yeah. And so I came in and I've used that skill to get to where I am now. And it was an accident. This is all accidental. I had no interest in being an entrepreneur. I had yeah. no interest in running my own company. So tell me about your company. Like, what do you do? Yes. Who do you serve? Like, how do you show up for them? What does that look like? So I empower professionals to snatch a seat at the table or break the table. There are no limits. I ensure that you know your worth. We identify your value and your unicorn-like abilities to get you into six figures, to make sure that your total comp is bad, but I'm not going to curse, but <laughs> I make sure that my clients understand how unique they are and how to leverage that uniqueness. A lot of us just miss the confidence. Yeah. A lot of us just miss, oh man, I don't want to ask for it. What that? The worst you can tell me is no. And then I'm going to figure out how to ask you in a different way to make you say yes. It's just having the goal, having that one strike of, you know what? forget this. I'm going to do it anyway. You don't have to be a risk taker, but you have to be able to count on yourself. So I take my clients, I shake them up. I'm a big ball of energy. I'm a fire starter. So after our initial coaching sessions, if you don't believe in you, I don't know who will. So I make sure that you leave me happy. You leave me more confident and empowered to do things that you never thought you could in your career. And it's been pretty freaking successful. I've blown myself away. I think we're what, six months in and half of my clients, probably 15 have hit six figures. Okay. So talk to me about this. You said a word and I immediately thought that the listener was having a thought around it. So you talked about unicorn abilities and I can yes. already hear a listener saying, Jessica, you don't know me. I'm nothing special. I'm so ordinary. My life is so boring. What do you say to people that believe that? Because there are so many women listening right now who have already written themselves off as like, good for her, but this isn't going to work for me. Of course. A lot of times I tell you to sit back. Think about all the things you do in a day. Yeah. Whether you are talking to people, whether you are on the computer all day, you do a multitude of things that you take for granted. You do damage control. You are able, if you're able to calm down an irate customer, you are our damage control to the max. It's just being able to finesse a little bit of what you do and mm -hmm. identify it in different corporate spaces. Or as an entrepreneur, you wear all hats, right? I wear every hat possible. I'm a Jill of all trades. You're a Jill of all trades. So sit back and give yourself a pat on the back, first of all, and make sure that you're bragging about yourself. That is our number one problem especially professional women, business women. We don't want to own our abilities. I was just having this conversation the other day and I was like, man, I haven't really done anything. And then my friend was like, well, write it down. I was like, okay, I'll write it down. Yeah. Write it down. I was like, oh shoot. We've hit 2.4 million in salary increases. Oh snap. Things that you normally do that doesn't seem like a big deal to you, put it on paper. Yeah. And share it with your accountability partners. Yeah. You have done things that other people will look at you and say, how the heck did you do that? What gave you the strength to do that? Give yourself the courage to accept your achievements. Yeah. I love and that. There is no normal. None of us are normal. Yeah. Some of us get up at five o'clock in the morning and go to the gym. You are a unicorn for sure. <laughs> that, that is something. Yeah. You know, your, your time management is crazy. Mm -hmm. Your assertiveness is crazy. 
Your ability to read a room is crazy. So take time to really reflect on the things that you do on a day-to-day and how it can apply to your success, how it can apply to your unicorn-like abilities. We all have them, at least five to 10. Yeah, I love that. I think so often we're too close to our own genius. Like we think the things that come natural to us are common sense for everyone. And those are the things that are like literally life-changing and business-changing and like career-changing. And I have found, and I'm curious if you do this in your practice, because I think part of what you do is speak into people and say, do you not see this is a gift? Like this is not normal in a good way. But I often think that for a lot of us, like you have to ask the people closest to you, like, tell me about me. Tell me about me. What do you want to learn from me? Or what are you inspired by? Or like, what are you curious about? Because if we don't have that inner dialogue, which I think many of us don't, we weren't given, we've adopted everyone else's dialogues. And most of the time it's about the things we're not good at and not about the things we're good at. Absolutely. So I'll tell anybody, make sure that you have three to six accountability partners. I have six. I have six men and women in my life that will say, look, you have lost your mind. You're either going to do it, take the risk, rip the bandaid off, or really have you lost your mind. You have to have this group of people who will remind you when you've fallen off of what type of fire pistol you are, of what type of light you are. As you mentioned, we don't know. We do this thing. We do this every day. Everybody can't be you. Everybody can't do what you do. And so when you have somebody sitting in front of you, even if it's just 10 minutes every week, hey, let's chop it up. Let's see, you know, here's what I did this week. Here's what I did this month. Here's what I've done this quarter. Yeah. That way people can say, what? I wouldn't do that. Look at you. Give you your kudos. You yeah. need your kudos. We forget how special we are, like you said. Yeah. And so to have people who, one, have no filter, who are candid as heck, all of my people are candid. Mm-hmm. Even before this, they were like, what? How do you do that? How do you get on camera and talk? It's just something I'm good at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. having people who have your best interest in heart, even comfortable to have the hard conversations to say, hey, you're not doing enough. You are so unique. You are so special. You can be a change maker. You can be a job snatcher. Get out there and do it. Get out there and do it. Take the risk. You are kind of like a resume doctor. Like, I feel like you go in and fix things up. So let's talk about when it comes to resumes or showcasing like your work. Uh, If you're a current entrepreneur, you're showcasing your work. You're kind of having your portfolio. What are some essential do's that every small business owner or someone who's looking for a career change keep in mind? Okay, so I've been coined the resume finesser. So what I tell people as an entrepreneur, you always want to have a leadership snapshot. You can either call it a leadership snapshot, an entrepreneurial snapshot, either of those, any of those people are like, oh, I don't want companies to be turned off. Let them be turned off. That's not the right company. You take this section in the beginning, one third of your resume, and you highlight everything that you've done that you can make an impact in. So if I was writing a resume for myself, I would make sure that my entrepreneurial snapshot or leadership snapshot gave percentages, big figures, and turnaround. Those are three things you need. Percentages, figures, and big turnarounds. Realistically, nobody cares about anything else, right? And as I tell a lot of my clients, any workshop that I do, if you can present figures, percentages, and turnarounds in bolded print, That's the only thing my eyes are going to see in the six to seven second scan. That means you have to sit down and write, what have you done? Who have you helped? And if you say, I haven't done anything, guess you have. If you've increased productivity to 100%, you've done something. If you've slashed cost by $37, you've done something that is impactful enough, especially as an entrepreneur, we can do anything. You can sell snow to a snowman, depending on where you're at. Do not cut yourself short and allow people to know that, hey, you know what? Wherever she goes, he goes, we can use their skill set. And as an entrepreneur, we need that resume. Yeah. We need it. We need it. We need it for funding. We need it for money. 
(laughs) So please don't think that you don't need one just because you're a business owner or an entrepreneur. It's very necessary. And highlight yourself. Get over the humbleness. We don't want humble on a resume. I don't care about humble. Why do you think women do that? Like why? Like, especially women. I just feel like so often it was funny the other day, Jessica, I was sitting with a friend and like, she is so strategic and savvy. And I love that about her. Like she makes it seem like everything just happens by chance. But like, I know that there is like this undercurrent of strategy. And I told her, I was like, I love how strategic you are. And she took it as like a, like, as in women are taught to like that strategic means conniving or like we connect these dots that don't exist. Why do you think that women are afraid to like sing their own praises? What is that? I think women are naturally reserved. Yeah. And I think when we get into corporate spaces, People don't expect us to speak up. So we just kind of fall in line, unfortunately. And when we get into a space where we start to have a voice and we advocate for ourselves, it's frowned upon. So you try to find a middle line like, oh, you know, I don't want to upset or shake the table or rock the boat. Now I shake the table and rock the boat because what that'll do is that increases your salary and your value. Whether somebody likes it or not is not your problem. We have this idea that we have to be liked. We have to come into spaces and be cheery. It, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to advocate for what's right, what I need to do, and how things need to be set up to work well. Women are naturally problem solvers. We are chaos resolvers by nature. So if you have a woman on your staff, be lucky. Yeah. You're very lucky because we could come in, like you said, your friend is a natural strategist. I have one too. And I'd be like, how the heck? what? How did yeah. you do that? And so fast. Yes. I was like, oh, you're amazing. That's why you're on my accountability team. Like, we need to make noise. We need to be seen and heard. And as women, we've just naturally been like, okay, you know, I'll take a step back. I know what I do behind the scenes. Let everybody else know what you do behind the scenes. Because nobody knows you realistically until you start making noise. Yeah. And then we get uncomfortable when we make too much noise. Like, oh, man. Everybody saw us. Good. And hopefully they're a little uncomfortable. I want to walk in a room and I want you to be a little bit uncomfortable just by how confident I am and how, you know, I'm getting ready to speak my piece. And women just naturally, it's like, okay, let me not rock the boat. No, rock the boat, girl. Rock the boat as much as you can. I love that. Leave a footprint everywhere you go. So you talked about the things to include. One of my friends, Glow Atomo, she does these amazing reviews of people's dating profiles of like, here's what not to include. So let's talk about what are the common mistakes that people make, whether it's their website, their resume, their portfolio, where you're like, stop doing this right now. Yeah, absolutely. So the number one thing, don't put your picture on a resume. Please stop doing that. I will drop kick you. (laughs) Do not put your picture on a resume. Instead, put your LinkedIn URL. People want to be nosy anyway. This is the era of nosy. Put your LinkedIn on there. Let them go find you that way. I have seen some of the scariest headshots. (laughs) It's just weird. It's weird. I don't want to flip through resumes and I see your photo. That's just weird. Whatever. Let me find you through LinkedIn. That way I can really do my investigative skills on your LinkedIn. Next, start putting your hobbies. Care that you like to skydive? Great. At least I know you have an outlet. I don't give a dang. That does nothing for me when I'm either trying to fund you or hire you. Nothing. Next. This is one of my biggest pet peeves. Stop using I, me, or my on your resume. Ooh, that's a good one. We know it's you. We know it's you. Start using power language when you start sentences, especially for your bullet points in your career experience, your entrepreneurial journey, however you want to label it. Whether you want to say that you orchestrated, launched, catapulted, skyrocketed, Mm -hmm. use language that's going to catch your reader's attention. Because realistically, you are just another piece of paper until you catch my eye. That's something that will always be important. Language. So here's the other tip. Use wordhippo.com. Ooh. Wordhippo.com will give you alternative language. Mm. So you're not just saying provided or I did. 
That's my favorite one. I did this. I don't care. <laughs> what, are, what was the impact from doing this? Yeah. Oh, and this is my other one. He got me going. I love this. This is my other one. Stop putting Googleable descriptions on your resume. You can look up your job title. I can look up your company. What have you done to make an impact, drive revenue, increase your employee retention rates? Let us know what you've done. I can Google your job. I can't Google you yet. And until I can fully Google you, tell us what you've done. Yeah. And remember, you got me going. You don't have to put everything. I don't care what you did when you were 15. I don't care what you did when you were 20, unless you're 23. Giving insight in the last 10 years will get you further than taking me back to when you had your first job. Yes. Nobody cares. I'm sorry. Nobody cares. I think it's wonderful. Your Got mom you here. cares. That's, that's about it. <laughs> right. The <laughs> professional development is awesome. Yeah. But make sure that you are giving us your light, your impact, and your turnarounds right now. Resumes are still necessary, but they're also only getting six to seven seconds of somebody's attention, whether you're applying for funding or a new role. Give us something worth reading. If I drop a stack of resumes, why should I pick yours up first? quick recommendation for you. If you love Gold Digger, check out My First Million hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Purry. Brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, My First Million features guests like Alex Ramosi, Sophia Amoruso, and Rob Deerdeck. They're sharing their secrets on how they made their first million and how to apply their learnings to capitalize on today's business trends and opportunities. I was just listening to them talk about Sean's AI plan dinner with tech billionaires, something I cannot relate to, but I am utterly curious about. And it was honestly so clever and also hilarious how he used ChatGPT to create the menu. You're going to love their candid business conversations, industry observations, and world-class advice. Listen to My First Million today, wherever you get your podcasts. On my health journey, I have been learning a ton about gut health. Your gut health impacts so many things. So if you're someone who's listening to this right now and you're feeling bloated today, I've got you. Ritual created Symbiotic Plus with us in mind. Ritual Symbiotic Plus contains clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. It even contains two of the world's most clinically studied probiotic strains, which provide fuel to the cells that make up your gut lining and support a healthy gut barrier. Trust me when I say this is a win-win. The delayed release capsule doesn't require refrigeration, so it's easy to take with you when traveling. I take mine every morning for digestive support, and I honestly love the minty taste. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. There's no more shame in your gut game. That's why Ritual is offering my listeners 20% off during their first month. Visit ritual.com slash gold digger to start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash gold digger. This is so good. It reminds me because we were recently working on a sales page for a product and it reminds me of so many things that you think about when it comes to marketing. Like what is the end result? Like, tell me about the end result. Don't tell me how you got there. Tell me the end result because you want to sell like my friend, Colin Boyd, he's a really good storyteller. And he's like, you want to sell like sitting in a cabana, drinking a drink, enjoying this beautiful sunset. You don't want to say like, I went in the Uber and then I went to the airport and I went through TSA and I got on the airplane. And I think so often when it comes to expressing things, we give like that a full scope and we forget to paint the end result. And I feel like what you're saying is like, just tell me the end result and what I can expect. I don't need to know every nuanced thing within that. Give me your bread and butter. Give me your bread and butter. Give me the conversation starter that will make me want to give you a call for an interview or see what your business looks like. How can I learn more about your business? That's the end result. We want the phone call. We want to secure the bag, as I tell my clients. And to be able to do that, people want to know who you are, what you've done, and how you can either save money or make money. Yes. Yes. Two of the most important things. Yeah. So don't be shy. Don't be shy. (laughs) Tell people that if you've come in and you've made a company $75 million, that should be the first line. A resume is definitely, that's you. That's your portfolio as a business owner, as an entrepreneur. When I submit my resume, the first line you'll see is Firestarter. 
fire igniting speaker. Yes. That caught your attention immediately. You may not read the rest of the paper, but you have to say, okay, let's figure out why she's a fire starter. What about this woman is going to set fire in rooms, turn cold rooms warm, and how is she going to shake things up? Oh, this is my other one. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't make your resume more than two pages. Yeah, this is not a dissertation. (laughs) No, but I've come across, I think I turned a 34-page resume into four. Oh, my Lanta. What? Yes. Yes. Granted, it was a military background. Sure. But still. Still. 34 pages. I (laughs) In three days, I turned 34 pages into four in three days. My eyeballs bled a little bit, but you still got the meat and potatoes. Yeah. the meat and potatoes. So is there this idea too of leaving some intrigue? Like you want to do enough to catch the attention, but then is there this level of like, you want to get them on the phone, right? Like that's the next yes. step. So how do you find that balance of like catching the attention, catching the eye and getting that phone call while still leaving like some of those questions unanswered because that's what the phone call might help you do. Is that something you think about? I do think about that. So when I finesse, especially a C-suite executive's resume, I want to make sure that, yes, I know you're the bomb.com, yeah. but when I'm writing your figures, yeah, I may just write your figures in that leadership snapshot. Yeah, They're that impressive that the reader is going to say, okay, how did you do this? How did you generate $400 million in a year? How were you able to increase employer retention rates by 70% with this company? Yeah. There's the cliffhanger. Yep. And so when you're writing your resume in the beginning, one third, that is your opportunity to say, okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure that my career executive summary, three to five sentences, five is a max. If you're just that, you know, hung up on giving that synopsis. Yeah. But three sentences, tell me what you bring to the table. This is your opportunity to say, hey, I come in. I leverage 20 years of expertise in whatever industry and then list your unicorn like skills. Yeah. Then the breeder is like, okay, how did you get this in this time span? Yes. You want to leave a question and it's just making sure that the language has a cliffhanger. Yeah. So I have a question for you that this is leading me to. We live in a world that eats with its eyes first. You said no pictures. How important is the design? Like, should people be going into Canva and designing this pretty resume? Like, does that matter? What would you say there? Because I am someone who I love like visually beautiful things. But then I'm like, are you shooting yourself in the foot by choosing something like that? What is your interpretation of that? So this is a great question. We do eat with our eyes and I believe that structure is everything. Yeah. Do not, first and foremost, do not go into Canva and create one of these resumes because what ends up happening, if you are looking for a job and you go through ATS, it won't be compatible. Mm. So use Word. Word is pretty, people don't give Word enough credit. (laughs) You can go in and you can incorporate shapes and colors. There's good colors you can use. Blue is like a power suit. Green means money. Like, let's see what you got depending on your industry will dictate how creative you can get. Okay. If you're in digital design, graphic design, then you can absolutely be more creative. Yeah. Now (laughs) my C-suite executives, my business owners use that power blue, use the money green. If sometimes I've done red just to make a statement, but I think it's important that your resume reflects your personality. Yeah. So if you are a colorful person, throw in a color. It's fine. But don't don't overdo it. Don't give me a blue background with a green lettering with, you know, a font that is in cursive. I've seen it all. Yeah. Make sure that you stay true to your personality. That's your opportunity to say, okay, here's my little razzle dazzle. Yeah. A nice blue with a crisp lettering, making sure that your font size is no smaller than 10.5. That's even small. Yeah. And being generous, making sure that, as you said, it's crisp to the eye. Yeah. Color is fine, but don't go crazy depending on your industry. So yes, color is fine. Like I said, if I drop your resume, why should I pick yours up first? Mm -hmm. It's going to be format. It's going to be structure. 
you might have some color on there. Have a look at yours first. Yeah. Everybody is black and white. Be the unicorn. Stand out. I love that. I keep thinking about, we recently worked with a copywriter on a project and she was so good at like pulling out the right headlines of like, people are skimming. Like you said, people are giving you six to seven seconds. And I think a lot of times on resumes, a missed opportunity is pulling out those strong words or those strong phrases, because if you're skimming it and maybe something's bolded, but it's still size 12, just like everything else, they might be missing the good stuff. So do you have any tips in terms of formatting? I think of it like a website or a sales page or something like that of like, just imagine and think and write for the skimmers because that's 99% of the people and make sure that what they're seeing is the most important stuff. Yes. The beginning one third of your resume is what matters. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, I'm not going to make it any further than that. So in the beginning one third, you'll have your content. Let me say this. You have your contact information, your phone number and your email to where we can reach you. I have seen resumes without emails or phone numbers. So Make sure that's at the top. You have your career executive summary. That's really going to be where you can say, hey, I turned around Fortune 500 companies. You know, I bent over backwards and turned into a turnaround champion for these either nonprofits or organizations. That's where you pull out the information that you want people to read. And followed by that, you would do your snapshot whether you call it a leadership, entrepreneurial, business owner, your choice, dealer's call. (laughs) You make it what your biggest impacts have been within the last year. Mm. And then I always follow up with soft and hard skills. No more than six that you outline. Those are buzzwords. Those are words that you've pulled from either their website, their job description, but you put them on there and you have to make sure that hey, these are skills that you have (laughs) or that you're capable of gaining before you get that opportunity. But that beginning one third is your meat and potatoes. After that, you know, hey, great. Make sure you sculpt out an impressive career experience section. But if I read it, great. If I don't, I already have all of the impact that I need from the beginning one third. Mm -hmm. So like you said, structure is everything. That one third, you have to go for the gold. Yeah, Let's say somebody's listening to this and they're in a job that they hate and they are like, I need an escape route. I need an emergency exit. I believe that your resume could be that for you. How important is personalization these days? Like, is your resume a one and done? Is it something you're tweaking? Is it something you're tailoring for different positions? Like walk me through that because I feel like so many of us learned if we were fortunate enough to even learn this of like, just create one and like disseminate it across the board. And so I think so much has changed. And so walk me through what that looks like. So absolutely. Resumes are never one and done. And I don't think you need 14 different resumes to be able to apply for different industries or companies. You have to have a strong, strong structure. So when I tell you that, you know, you have the beginning one third, soft and hard skill section, those are all areas that you can tailor to match a company's mission statement, their vision, or when you're going for a specific role, pay attention to the details and the keywords that the job description displays. And if you're using LinkedIn, you can go and look at the language. They give you the (laughs) keywords and skill sets that you need. at the end of the job description for most. So you have the cheat code. It's just doing your due diligence. Never turn in the same resume for two jobs. I'm going to say that. Never turn in the same resume for two jobs. And if you're applying for a company, please do not apply for more than two jobs at the same company. They're going to see your resume for one. (laughs) Relax. But be sure that you take 10 to 15 minutes. Compare your resume to the job description, your resume, to the vision statement of that company or that pitch that you're getting ready to shoot out, especially for us business owners. We all know how to make words sweet, right? We know how to hook people in. This is your opportunity to hook people in visually first to get that phone call. So no, do not, it's not one and done. I wish it was, but it's not. Yeah. Because when your resume gets into somebody's hands, That's where the magic happens. That's where you're able to get a feel for that person. 
and they're actually going to take time to read your resume. Mm -hmm. So make it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, it's like a sandwich. What do you like on your sandwich? Lettuce, tomato, pickle, whatever. Make sure then you add that special sauce. This is your special sauce. How are you going to stand out in your language, your summary, and take the time? I get it. It's hard. First of all, job searching is hard. Yeah. Writing a resume, if I wasn't so dang good at it, this would not be my first choice of career. Yeah. It's hard. So give yourself grace, but also know that you can tackle a resume. And the more you do it, the easier the language will come. The easier it is for you to spot out key language and key words that you need to finesse into your specific resume per application, per submittal, per pitch. I'm pretty sure chat GBT could do a lot of that work for you too. If you copied a job description and said, pull yeah. out the key words that you see here. I'm curious that like, I just keep thinking of like, wow, it'd be actually quite easier than I think we're making it out to be in order to find those themes. One thing you've talked about, Jessica, and I'm super curious about, it was once a very neglected space in our business, which was LinkedIn. And I actually had a LinkedIn expert come onto my podcast years ago. And I was like, this is your chance to tell me why LinkedIn matters and why we should be spending time on the yep. platform. But what's fascinating is, is that the last six hires that we've made for my company have all been through LinkedIn. And I love it for so many reasons because people can't fudge their experience. It is literally right out there. Here's exactly what I've done. Here are the roles I've played. And for mm-hmm. me, we're at a place where we want people that have experience. Like we are no yep. longer in a position of like, we just want people and we'll teach you. We want people with experience. Talk to me a little bit about LinkedIn. Is it a missed opportunity? Are people like resistant to it, but they should be on it? Is it a waste of time? What is your perception? So LinkedIn is your opportunity to be an anti-private eye. I'm able to get on there, look up quality candidates, look up CEOs, look up people that I want to connect with, whether I'm a job seeker or a job snatcher or a CEO or business owner. I think it's an underutilized tool especially for us business owners, Mm -hmm. you can find anything on there. I can find hiring managers, recruiters. I can find CEOs that I need to connect with to build partnerships, to build a rapport. People think, oh, well, if I'm not looking for a job, I don't need LinkedIn. Yeah, right. LinkedIn is where the money is. Yeah. And people take that for granted. Yeah. I've won grants off of LinkedIn. I've built partnerships off of LinkedIn. People have found me off of LinkedIn. Like there are so many opportunities to show up and show out on a professional platform that owners don't take advantage of. Entrepreneurs think, well, you know, I'm a business owner anyway. What do I need LinkedIn for? There are people out there who are willing to invest in you. There are people out there who want to build partnerships with you, but I can't find you. I don't know you. Nobody knows us yet until we've scaled our visibility crazy. LinkedIn is definitely an underutilized tool. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why. Mm -hmm. It's not like you have to spend four hours on it. Get on there 30 minutes. You don't have to make dancing videos on LinkedIn, people. That part. You can show up as your authentic self with grown people. Grown people who are looking to spend money, make money, and save money. Yeah, yeah. I love it. We utilize it and we love it. And it was something that was totally neglected because it wasn't as shiny as Instagram or Facebook, but it has been a massive tool in our company, not only in hiring, but like you said, in collaborating and finding people. And also if you're someone who wants to do big things, say you want to go on the Today Show, you can find producers of the Today Show on LinkedIn and connect with the people who are in charge of the people, right? Like there's so many ways that you can leverage this platform on a professional standard where it's like, you can skip like looking at what somebody ate for breakfast and see what results they've actually driven for something. Exactly. And you can find anything and anybody on LinkedIn. Yeah. If you are a business and you don't have a LinkedIn, you need to rethink that today. Mm -hmm. There's opportunities out there. There is money out there and you have an untapped resource that you should be taking advantage of. Yeah. That's the one thing we love visibility, right? But we don't want to show up. Okay, right. write a post. Right. <laughs> you don't have right. to show up and you don't have to show what you ate for breakfast. You don't have to show you walking down the street. Yeah, You can write a post and generate a big buzz around yourself. Yeah. So LinkedIn will allow you to expand your resources, expand your business, 
and give you more insight to what other people are doing. Like you said, if mm-hmm. I want to be on the Today Show, CNN or whatever, you can find the people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Those are the people that make the it. decisions anyways. So <laughs> the people who are going to say yay or nay. Yeah, absolutely. Not just the views. Yes. Okay, Jessica. So if somebody is listening to this right now, what are yeah. three things that they can do by the end of today that can help them either clean up, start or edit their resume or their website in a way that will help them get seen and valued for what they bring to the table? Absolutely. So the first thing you can do is remove anything that's beyond 10 years. Whether it's information, images, a lot of us do not look the same as 10 years ago. <laughs> Let's give people an updated <laughs> version of who we are and what we look like today. And that gives that fresh feel. Visuals give a fresh feel, especially for our websites, our LinkedIn, give people a fresh feel. Next for your resume, you want to make sure that you are giving people your stats, give stats. Same thing for your website, give metrics. A lot of us just have a pretty piece of paper with nothing on it. Give stats, metrics, figures, percentages, and turnaround. And then the last thing you want to make sure that you are not oversharing. Mm. Don't overshare. That's where we go to the length of your resume or especially your website too. Don't overshare. Give us a reason to call you. You sparked my interest. Now let's talk. I don't want to hear the long drawn out story of how you got there, what you did, what road you took. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you did and how you got there. And then let's talk. So you want to make sure that you're always having conversational sparks on your resume or website. So that could be a figure. Like sometimes I'll put in my website, $2.4 million. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, okay, did you make that? What have you done with that 2.4 million? Yeah. It's not me. Trust me. It's not me. (laughs) It's my clientele. So do enough to spark somebody's interest to reach out to you Mm. and make a conversation. Those are the top three things. Get rid of your clutter. Make sure that you're not oversharing and give us some metrics your percentages, your figures, and your turnaround. So I am going to ask you one final personal question, but as you have become this entrepreneur, what has been the best part and the hardest part of entrepreneurship that you didn't anticipate? So the best part is making my own schedule. Mm. I'm Mm -hmm. able to, you know, have coffee with that friend or take a flight somewhere because I don't have anywhere to be the next morning, so to speak. The next one is turning off. That's the hardest thing. I was just talking to a friend and I was like, I haven't slept. Mm -hmm. Okay. Life goes on. The show must go on. So not being able to turn off because we're always thinking about a different way to show up. We're always thinking about a different way to make money. Mm -hmm. And I think as a business owner, we feel more comfortable talking about figures and salaries. Mm -hmm. That's one of the best parts. The other part is how am I going to do it? Where am I going to get it from? Who am I going to ask it from? (laughs) What am I going to do to get there? So not being able to turn off is one of the hardest things. I've actually had to get a therapist. I've been in therapy probably two years, going on three maybe. And she's helped me streamline, you know, being able most times (laughs) to turn off, set boundaries and be able to say no when it's outside of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, I agree. I agree. The final thing that came to mind is if somebody's Mm -hmm. listening to this, do you have any advice on how they can establish if they are better as an entrepreneur or an employee? I think they're both great roles. The world needs both. They need entrepreneurs and employees. And I think sometimes people have a hard time establishing which one is the right role for them. Do you have any tips on that? I do. And I'm just going to speak from personal experience. Yeah. When I knew that corporate was no longer serving me because I would show up and I already did the work, I already had the conversations. And I'm going to say this very candidly, I don't like being told what to do. And so once I figured that out, I was like, okay, you don't like being told what to do. These people pay your check. What are you going to do instead? What do you do naturally well? Yeah. And... Could you do it even if you weren't making money? There we go. Think about those things. If you can do it, even though you're not making money, because realistically, we don't make money every day. Yeah. Sometimes you have wonderful months. Sometimes you have dry multiple months. You have to be comfortable knowing that I'm going to be 
in a cash flow crunch sometimes, yeah. but can I still do this work? And if you can, by all means, take the risk. I think Les Brown says without risk, there is no reward. But if you're like, okay, I like consistent checks Yep. on time in my account, stay where you're at. I love that. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. on the podcast. You have amazing resume templates. Tell us about those and where everyone can find out more about you, the work you do and potentially work with you. Give us all of the places. Yes, absolutely. So if you need a template, you can check out my Etsy store or my website. They all have the same link, JMW Career Consultant. And then if you want to work with me, connect with me on LinkedIn. Use your LinkedIn abilities. (laughs) My website, jmwcareerconsultant.com. I'm very responsive. You can even hit me up on Instagram. I'm not as active as most people, but I will respond. You won't see me dancing, but I'll respond. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yes. This was amazing. And I'm so excited for our listeners to take those steps to update and present themselves and share their secret sauce with the world. I think there's something yes. so contagious when you're surrounding people who know with confidence what they're good at, what they do, how they show up and impact the world. There is something so beautiful. So the more people that can do that, the better. And hopefully today you have the tools to do exactly that. Thanks for coming on, Jessica. Yes. I love today's episode. I think it's such a beautiful reminder to really honor and understand what makes you different and learn how to strategically communicate those differences in a way that catches people's attention. I feel like today, attention is the new currency. And if we are wanting to stand out from the crowd and express what we can bring to the table, we have to be incredibly thoughtful and introspective and aligned with what is our secret sauce and how do we communicate that. I absolutely love today's episode with Jessica. I hope you enjoyed it too. Make sure to take action. And if anything, just ask the people closest to you in your life to speak into you, to tell you about you so that you can remember those things that make you you unique, special, and impactful in this beautiful world we find ourselves in. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 